to be here and um, uh, to let me into to the group. And after hearing Dr. Federer speak and Maddie speak, I'd also like to point out to Bri that Brianne, who's here as well, helped me tremendously over those two inception trips I took to the DRC in June and September. But after hearing um, these introductions, it makes me want to change what I'm going to say, quite frankly, because we covered so much ground. But before that, I just, I'm really inspired to say, like, do not undermine what you're doing here tonight. You know, these civil society groups and community-based <coughs> organizations eventually over time cohere to grassroots movements. And those grassroots movements eventually cohere to political movements. And then you change the world. And that's a long arc. And history sometimes, I think, forgets that arc. And it's a lot like the media needs a hook line to a certain extent. But uh, So please don't discount all, all the work that you're doing here tonight. Now, I'll bring it back to one of the themes <coughs> of, which is action. And uh, something that uh, is incredibly important to me. I understand the need for discourse, but eventually you have to get your boots dirty. So what I wanted to talk about is the journey a little bit on Song for Africa and how we came across this music original program model and how we're implementing it and then you can ask me some, some questions on it. Um, as Mandy pointed out, it, Song for Africa started in 2006. Um, I started as a music producer and I decided to get a bunch of my well-known Canadian music mm -hmm. friends together to do a single to raise money and awareness for the AIDS pandemic. And we launched during the International AIDS Conference during the opening ceremonies. And at that time, quite frankly, I thought that was it. I thought that was going to be my job and I'd go back to my uh, regular gig in the studio. And shortly thereafter, I took my first trip to Af Africa, which was Kenya. And um, you do get forever change when you have those experiences. And we came across the idea after that was, well, why don't we do a documentary that traces the money? So people say, like, is my money going to something useful? Let's prove it to them. Let's say you supported this song, you're a fan of this band, look at the school that we built out of it. Let's make that line really concrete. And then I thought, well, that'll be enough. I'm done. I'm going to go back to my regular <laughs> life. And five years later, that has not happened. And it took us some time to find our feet, so to speak, because we were comprised of mostly artists, musicians, producers, and we're not doctors, we're not politicians, and uh, we're not lawyers, although I have several on my board. So over time, it took us a, a little bit. We helped, we built a school, we helped two AIDS clinics, uh, we started a scholarship program that runs the biggest slum in Africa still, which is called Kibera. And during our second documentary shoot in Rwanda, we had an, uh, basically a day off from shooting. And we were also recording an album in Rwanda, so we decided uh, through some friends at Partners in Health, which is a great organization working in Rwanda to rebuild um, the healthcare system there, we decided that, you know, let's take some of this uh, recording equipment that we brought and give the kids in the local community a, a day. You know, let's give them a day to record their songs and see, um, you know, see what they can do artistically. And we did not coach them at all or coax them or tell them what to do in terms of the lyrics or the content or what kind of songs they were going to be. And as you're going to see in this video, and as I'll explain later on, all the songs that came back were really, really heavily burdened about HIV and their rights as children. And what we learned was these are all taboo subjects they couldn't talk about in their everyday lives. Over the dinner table, it was not acceptable, but through a song, culturally, it was acceptable. And then also, yes, you'll be able to see that music galvanizes communities. And I'm not trying to be very trite here, but no matter where you are in the world, most kids still want to be a rock star. And it is a great way to get communities together. And as a, you'll also see in the video shortly that demonstrate this, you have you know, children that live in extreme poverty, less than a dollar a day, coming in with all their best homemade hip-hop outfits. <laughs> now the second part of this, which I'll get into a little bit more later, is that um, not only do you have that front end of it, is that the music after can resonate through communities greatly. So you get a great return on investment. I want to get into that more and get more to specifically how this ties to the Pansy Hospital and what you're doing here tonight in terms of uh, the movement against with women. 
but first I'd like to show the, the, the little three and a half minute video which was the first pilot that we did of this program which again demonstrates um, how we discovered the model basically completely by accident uh, but then decided to chase it and take it seriously. So let me play the video and make sure the volume is up. Seminar. Our job of the program is to help record your songs. With the expertise that South Africa has in music, and seeing more and more that that's what really got the students to come alive and what most excited them, then it made the most sense to do something that focused around that. <laughs> It was hard for us to, to take in when they handed us the sheets of lyrics. And I was like, oh my god. They weren't singing songs that somebody else had recorded, they were singing songs that they wrote about things that they were going through or that their families had gone through. These students are the most vulnerable students in their districts. Um, they're usually HIV, AIDS orphans, or are um, HIV positive themselves. As a fellow musician, I just wanted to know uh, what it means to you to write songs and sing them in front of people. Seemed like they recognized that they were uh, vessels for a message, which is amazing. Big coffee, big coffee, big coffee with the Hades. Hades is easy, terrible, easy, dangerous. Big coffee with the temptation of sugar daddy and sugar money. <laughs> <laughs> They felt like they were part of the, a solution. They felt like they were um, making something better with their <coughs> with their suffering, really. Um, yeah, I, got, I think I'll take that away from this whole experience as a whole. People are sort of alchemizing their suffering, you know, turning it into something so wonderful and so transformative. Hey, Hey, Mr. Yeah. So, Sarah, do you want it right off the top? All right. Uh, you know, as a side note, the, the, the producer in me loves that because um, I think in, in Canada and Western society, a lot of music can be, it's been, it's been like background noise at times. It's, it's a bit throwaway, but uh, in these areas, it, 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 it means life and death to them. And you can see uh, how sincere they are in their, in their performances. Now with the model itself, uh, as you can see, it's a peer-to-peer -peer education model that's inclusive and also impacts passive recipients. And it's really a two-pronged approach. So you have the, the first rung of the therapeutic end of music, which we can talk a little more specifically in the Pansy Hospital um, example in a second. But you have that rung of therapy of music of getting things off your chest that you normally cannot do. And then the output of that, 